about the victory this morning. I said, do you have the victory this morning? Hallelujah. Who is victory through this morning? No other than who? Jesus. Let me hear you say his name. Who? Jesus. Say it one more time. Jesus. Hallelujah. You may be seated at the sun. It is so good to be in God's house this Sunday morning, this victory Sunday morning. Yeah. What about Monday through Saturday? Victory too, because that's it's right. all in Jesus that's Christ. Right. Hallelujah. It's all through Jesus Christ. That's who we have the victory in. Right. There's nobody else Jesus. that can do us like yes. God. Yes, God. Man can be good to you for a certain time, and perhaps there are people that are good to you most, if not all the time, but nobody can ever do you good like Jesus That's Christ. Right. Amen. Yeah. Man will fail you from time to time. Some people fail people all the time, but Jesus never, ever fails. You may think of a time when you were going through something that seemed like, well, God didn't answer it. But God answers his prayer. Your, your prayers, he always takes care of you. It may not come when you want it. That's right. But that answer prayer is going to come right on time. What about those things that I didn't get? If you didn't get it, God just didn't give it to you because you know you didn't need it. Sometimes he doesn't allow us to have certain things because we aren't ready for it. And there's certain things he doesn't allow us to have because we don't need it because those things can also hurt us. You know, sometimes we say, say, well, God, you know, I want this type of car. I want X amount of money. But God knows what's going to destroy us. Some people, they get money and destroy them. You ever see people get, get, get this big payday, all of a sudden they sign this multi-million dollar contract, and what happens? Life goes downhill. It's never the same after that. So God knows exactly what he has need of. I'm thankful for the mercy and the love of Jesus Christ. He loves us more than we even love ourselves. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. At this time, we're going to take up our Sunday morning tithes and offerings. God's been so good to us, and it's a blessing just to be able to give back yes. a portion yes. to God of what he's given us. Hallelujah. At this time, Brother Brad, can you help us receive the Sunday morning tithes and offerings? Say, Oh, my day. 
running after us, oh God. Yes. Thank you, God, that when there were 90 and 9, you would leave them behind and come after us oh, as yes. that All one right. lost sheep. Right. Yes. The one in need, oh God, that you do not neglect and rejoicing over that one that you have restored even more than the 90 and 9 that remained. Thank you, oh God, for your mercy and your grace. Hallelujah. Praise God. He's a good God. Amen. Amen. He is a good God. Taking our Bible reading this morning from Romans. 
chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, beginning to read it. Well, we're going to take two verses. Verses 17 and 18. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Reading those two verses again, that's Romans 14, verses 17 and 18. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. With the help of the Lord this morning, with the help of the Holy Ghost, preaching a message with the title, A True Standard. Amen. Reverend Brooks, sir, would you please pray over the message in the message? I love it, Father. We're so thankful for another time to gather in your house to hear the word, Father. I ask you to bless Pastor Watson as he preaches your word, God. Give him a fresh function of all we do, God. Make preaching easy for him. Open our hearts to yes. receive, God, what you prepare by your servant, Lord God. We appreciate you. We love you. We're thankful for all you've done for us, Father. Yes. Have your way. Continue to bless, Lord God, in Jesus' most precious holy name. Amen. Amen. In this passage of the book of Romans, Paul is writing to Christians. You know, as you're reading the New Testament and all of the things that Paul wrote in his letters to the churches where he's giving instructions, where he's saying such things as in uh, 1 Corinthians, the uh, spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet and let all things be done decently and in order as as we've looked at in Bible study, just bringing it out in recent weeks, or, or any other kind of instructions that would catch you, maybe in Galatians where he's talking about, um, uh, am I now become your enemy because I tell you the truth, and, and different things that are brought out in Scripture. As you're reading those, realize that Paul is writing all of these things to believers. He's writing all of these things to people who already know Christ, who have received Jesus as their Savior, but need further instruction. Just as we continue to look to the Bible, Scripture, for our daily bread, for our spiritual sustainment in life. But here in Romans chapter 14 and continuing with the same theme through chapter 15, Paul is writing to Christians concerning their outward conduct when they get together and they see that this brother might not be living up to my standard. That sister might be doing things differently than I am. And they begin to judge one another based on the standards that they see among themselves. And some of that he has to set straight. Such as food and drink. And he corrects them in, in thinking that, uh, oh, because the Old Testament law had some of these restrictions, they carry over. And he, he corrects them in showing that, no, God has allowed these things as long as it's received with thanksgiving. That's right. Okay, and you can read that in other portions of Scripture as well. And that's where this statement that the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink comes in. But coming further from that, he says, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost for he that in these things serveth Christ, not in the outward standards that other brothers or sisters in the church think that you're not living up to, or that you think that you have to attain to what other person in the church is living up to, say, I'm not all the way to the set level that they're at yet, so I must not be all the way a Christian as they are. He said it's not in these outward things, all right, all right. but in peace and righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Now over the past couple of weeks we've preached messages that are set a pretty high standard for our moral conduct. Over the past couple of weeks, we've looked at Hebrews chapter 4, and we saw that the word of God is a discerner even of the thoughts and the intents of the heart so that you can't say, oh, I did the right thing for the wrong reason, or oh, I did the wrong thing for the right reason. But you have no excuse for sin, because by the word of God, we know what is right. We know what is wrong. God does discern even our motives behind the things that we do. We have no excuses for doing the things that are wrong, That's right. because we can plainly see 
And even if we go back to Romans chapter 1, there are things that are plainly discernible by nature, even with God uh, not giving a specific word by the Holy Ghost that this is wrong, this is right. There are things discernible simply by the way that he created nature, that it just doesn't go that way. Okay? But we've looked at some things that make it very clear that there are no excuses for sin. We looked last week at the book of Colossians and, and saw that everything matters. Every aspect of our conduct, every aspect of our faith, every aspect of our lives matters. Yes, washing the dishes. Yes, singing praises unto God. Yes, everything that we do, let everything be done to give God the glory. Right. Okay, Amen. everything in our lives matters because we belong to God. Okay, okay? but the true standard of our salvation is not the outward conduct. Outward conduct is a very important aspect of Christianity. And that's what we were looking at the past couple of weeks. And we've even gone further back into some of the messages that we preached and we've seen where Samuel went to anoint David as king over Israel and, and uh, uh, Jesse's first son came before him and he said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. And God spoke to Samuel and said, He's the one that I've rejected. Man looks at the outward, yeah. and I look at the heart. That's right. That's right. And we yeah. see that God does see our heart and the work that he has done in our lives. And he looked at that son of Jesse and said, his heart isn't going to be conformed to my will. Mm -hmm. But as he went down the line and found David, he said, there's a man after my own will. Right. Right. There's a man whose heart yes. will be conformed yes. to my own will. Even if he's done wrong, he's not going to try and justify himself. No. Even when he's no. sinned, yeah. he's not going to try right. and make excuses right. for it. He's right. just going to get it right. Yes. Yes. Which was Saul's problem the whole time. But that's, you can go back and find the videos on those, those messages that we preached. Outward conduct is an aspect of Christianity, but it's not the proof of being a Christian. Mm -hmm. Right. Anybody can conform to an outward standard. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. We see it all over the place with these things, don't we? Mm -hmm. Anybody? <laughs> anybody can conform to an outward standard without really having it in their heart. That's mm -hmm. right. <laughs> it's not the proof of it. Our, our our outward conduct is something that we have control over. It's something that we can change. Just like we put on different clothes for different places that we go. We can control what we do. We can control how we conduct ourselves in certain circumstances, in certain environments. We'll change. But our salvation is only something that God can do. Right. Our salvation right. is only by a work that God has done that we could not do for ourselves right. and by our faith in Him. Mm -hmm. Now, I've heard people say, and I know that the, that the the sentiment behind it is so sincere, and so I, I'm not critical of people who say it. God did something for me. God paid a price for me that I could never pay for myself. Now, God did something for me that I could never do for myself when he saved me. All right. That's right. That's right. But the truth of the matter, if you want to get very serious about it, and again, I'm not critical of anybody who makes that statement because it's a very sincere and appreciative statement. But the truth of the matter is that I could have. I could have paid the price for my own sins. And what would that price have been? Death and hell for eternity. That's right. That's right. Okay. That's right. But he paid that price yes, for me. Right. Yes. And by him, by faith in him, and by him paying it for me, thank God I don't have to. All right. Yes. All right. My account is paid in full by what he did. Salvation is by faith in what he did for me. So that I don't have to. All right. I could live outwardly and inwardly without faith and without regard for the standards of God and righteousness. And then I could pay the price for that. Mm -hmm. But thank God, that's what salvation is. It's right. that Jesus went to the cross. Yes. Yes. He yes. shed his innocent and yes. sinless blood right. as that's our right. sacrifice. Right. Right. For the wages of sin is death, that's but the true. gift of God is eternal life yes. by Jesus Christ our yes. Lord without the shedding of blood. There is no remittance. You can find it all the way through the Bible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Old Testament and New Testament. What do you think all those animal sacrifices right. were pointing to? But all that right. final oh, yeah. sacrifice, yeah. once and for all, Jesus Christ on the cross. Yeah. But because the price he was paying was not his own, because the sins Come were on. not his own, because he went to the cross willingly, 
He rose from the dead. Yes. Right. All power in heaven and earth given unto him. Amen. Amen. And by faith in him, salvation is what we have by him. Yes. All right. Amen. Outward conduct, again, is an aspect of Christianity, but it's not the proof of it. Salvation is faith in Jesus Christ and the work that he did. Because we couldn't pay that price, but we couldn't have saved ourselves. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have been able to rise again. But he did it for us, and he said, you believe on me, you can have that victory. Yes. You can have that salvation. Our faith is not proven in our conduct. Now, again, not to take away from the things that we've been preaching the last weeks, okay? Because it's important. But our faith is proven, what he said here, in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Because we can change our outward conduct. We can do that ourselves. People do it all the time. Jesus dealt with hypocrites many times. But we cannot change our own righteousness. That's right. That's right. Our faith is proven in the righteousness of Christ, which is a clean heart. As he said to the prophet Isaiah, Come now, let us reason together. saith the Lord, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. When I was a kid, we used to go camping up on Mount Hood in Oregon. And uh, Mount Hood is, is a, a place where they have skiing year-round because there's always snow on the mountain. And we would go up there in August, and I, I've never skied in my life. That wasn't what we did. But we'd just go up there and put up a tent in the woods, and, and sometimes we'd go up a little bit higher in elevation to where the, uh, the snowpack was. And we'd go up there, and you know, a couple of minutes on the snow, as pale as I am, I'd get sunburned just from the reflection of the sun off of the snow, even on a cloudy day. Jesus said, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. That's not white, white like this altar. That's not white like this table. It's not white like anybody's complexion. That is pure and yes. dazzling, yes. clean. Yes. In another place, he said, like no fuller on earth can make it. A fuller mm. is a person who did laundry and would specialize in making clothes, especially bright and white, mm. just like that detergent you see the commercials for. Mm. But right. God does a much better job than All that. right, all right. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, they shall be red. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool. And then Paul said in the book of Philippians, being found in him, not having my own righteousness. My own righteousness. Isaiah said in another place, it's just as filthy rags. That's right. My own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith yes. of Christ. Yes. The righteousness which is of God by faith. Our salvation is not proved in outward conduct. It's proved by God having well, cleansed our heart. That's right. And that's something that people can't see from the outside. And that's why he's saying don't measure yourselves by the outside conduct. Mm -hmm. Our faith is proven in the peace that we have with God. Before we came to God, we were at odds with God. We were in a state of enmity with God. A state of being enemies opposed to God. Not because he was against us, but because we were against him. Refusing him. But when we let down our guard and surrendered to him and oh, accepted him, right. then we were justified by faith. Yeah. And he said in Romans chapter 5, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace. With God, yeah. through our Lord yeah. Jesus Christ. Amen. It's as if two enemies had been Come fighting on. against another. And they wrote a peace treaty. All right. That peace is lasting. Peace is not the absence of conflict. As in we don't get along with this person or that person. Peace is in we are in agreement with God. That the way I used to be, I'm not that way anymore. Right. Because he's done something for me, I'm going to now live for him. He said, to be carnally minded is death. Romans chapter 8. Those that have not turned their hearts to Christ, those that have not believed on him, those that have not received him, those that have not accepted him, to be carnally minded, to have your mind focused on this world, is death. But to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace, because you've made peace with God. Our faith is proven in the joy that he gives us simply in knowing Christ has come to save us. Yes, yes. There are a lot of circumstances in life that can bring us down, that can make us sad. And the Bible acknowledges that. The Bible, Jesus even acknowledged that. Jesus wept, okay? But even with the circumstances of life that we face that make us sad, there's still joy within mm -hmm. that says, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes All in the right. morning. All right. Amen. We have that faith. 
And by that faith, the joy of simply knowing that he came to save us, even as the shepherds were told by the angels when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, it says, Lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Anybody who receives this one who came into the world as their deliverer, anyone who receives him, They'll receive of that joy. Fear not. Right. Don't be afraid of the things that would bring you down in this world because he's come to lift you up above All this right. world. Amen. Amen. Anyone can put on an outward show of conforming to a set of regulations. I remember when I was in the military, brand new. This other guy who was brand new in the military also. Same time of service as me and everything. We, we didn't know each other in boot camp. But it's in boot camp that they tell you the standards that you have. You know, in the Marines, they're pretty strict even about how you dress in civilian clothes. Uh, because you're, you're representing, you know, a branch of service that takes a lot of pride in who they are. You know, to be, to be frank about it, the Marines do hold themselves to a high standard. And, and some Marines can be pretty cocky about it if you've ever known any Marines. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I hope I'm not among them. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm thankful for the opportunities that God has given me. Amen. And I'm thankful for the things that, that God did in my life while I was in the military. Yes. Amen. It's in the military that I met my wife. She was in the Air Force. Yeah. Um, but uh, one of the things that they, they really emphasize is, is you conduct yourself in a certain way. Military standards, uh, bearing, and, and don't disgrace you know, the title Marine, and, and the emphasize you know the proper regulations for wearing the uniform but then they also emphasize proper regulations for how you dress as a civilian and I get to the airport in between the training event and, and going to another duty station or something and I see this guy and I don't know if he saw me or not but he had been in one of my training cycles and, uh, and he's just dressed like nothing mm-hmm. I mean and I don't want to I don't want to say anything because maybe you caught up with him later on but uh i mean you wouldn't have known that he was military by the way maybe that's way he wanted it to look maybe he didn't want anybody to know that he was military (laughs) but he sure didn't look it and i wouldn't have known if i didn't know who he was but anybody can put on an outward show of conforming to regulations when people are watching Mm -hmm. that's right right. and then when they think nobody's watching they begin acting the way that they've always lived before the way that they like okay and even though we've been preaching against sin the past couple of weeks, we're not taken away from that. But even within that, it's often the more conscientious people. When, when a message is preached against things that, that really are hard-hitting, it's the people who are more conscientious, the people who, who really have a heart to say, God, if there's anything wrong in my life, I need to get it right, who will take to heart even the warnings that are not against the things that they're doing, just because they'll keep it in their heart not to go and fall to it later on. Mm-hmm. The people who are more conscientious, the people who really have a heart to serve God, are always going to take the warnings and say, this is not what I want to go to. Mm-hmm. Even as he said in 1 Corinthians, let a man examine himself. Let a man examine himself. You hear warnings. You hear scriptures being read. You see it in the Bible. And it may not be something that you've done, that you've been guilty of, even in the past if God has forgiven you. But you say, oh God, search me. Let it not be found in me. They practice uh, vigilance in their lives. While those who need the warnings. Because of the danger of judgment that they face. They'll disregard the preaching. Or often they'll be offended at it. They say, why was the preacher preaching about that? Why was the preacher preaching about that? Did somebody tell him? No. All right. No. All right. So, so. I wrote this, this particular message on Monday evening. God had been dealing with me about, honestly, I'll tell you, God had been dealing with me about how heavily the past couple of weeks have been preached. And God had given me those messages. Mm-hmm. But he said, now you need to back it up and show the other side of it. Mm-hmm. And he just gave me this message. So Monday afternoon, Monday evening, I wrote this out, this outline with the scriptures that God gave me for. I didn't know who'd be here this morning, from last week or from other times. 
But people can change their outward conduct based on who they think is watching. And those who need the warnings are often the ones who disregard it or get offended at it. And that was the case with the Pharisees in Jesus' day. They were the ones that led the charge in calling to crucify him. Those Pharisees who thought they had God all locked up, who thought they could set him in their own box and say, this is how God works. And we'll put on the show that shows that we know how God works. But Jesus called him, called him out on it. He said, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but inside you're full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, also outwardly you appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Paul wrote to Timothy that there would be those having a form of godliness denying the power thereof. The Pharisees had that outward show of doing things right, but inwardly, in their own hearts, they denied what God had come to give them. They denied the righteousness of God in their own hearts by not conforming with their hearts. They denied peace with God by refusing God. They denied themselves the joy that God came to bring by not accepting the joy bringer. Come on, that's right. He called them out on their hypocrisy. And people make an outward show of conformity. And just as the hypocritical Pharisees did, they'll nitpick at the faults of others. And that's kind of what Paul was dealing with here in Romans 14. Nitpicking at the faults or what they perceive as faults in others. Not realizing, hey, God's working in their life. That's right. God's working on them. Right. That might be something that I had to go through. Months or years or however long it's been since God dealt with me on that. But now God's working in them. I don't have to nitpick them on it. All right, all right. The right attitude, even if it becomes necessary for one Christian to help another Christian with the situation that they're facing, uh, facing weakness or sin in their lives, the right attitude, even if it becomes necessary at that point, is that we must do so in meekness, mm -hmm. And humility, right. because we realize that there are things in our own lives that God is working on. That's right. Yeah. We realize, hey, God, I'm not perfect. You've started that work, but you haven't finished it yet. Amen. Paul said in Galatians, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, mm -hmm. considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. We don't go and bully somebody because they're not living up to our standards because we're not the ones that set the standard. All right, all right. They're not trying to be like us. Right. God didn't make any of us to be like each other. Come he on. wants us to be like yes. Him. Yes. And when Amen. we're trying to be like Him, when we're living for Him, that's a standard that we all say, Oh Lord, I fall so short, I can only do it by you. Not right. by this one, not by that one. But it's you, Lord, that's going to help me yes. to achieve that. Paul said to first, in 1 Corinthians, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And in other places, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. That's That's right. And in other places, he said, if I or anybody else preach unto you anything now, then what you've already received, let him be accursed. He said, there's one gospel. Yes. I've given Amen. it to you by revelation of Jesus Christ. Yes. I'm not right. going to come back right. later and try to change That's it. Right. If I do, then you'll know there's something wrong in my life. All follow right. me as I follow Christ. Amen. 2 Corinthians, he wrote, we dare not, we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. Oh, you've got to do it the way I'm doing it. Once you're doing it like me, then you'll have it down. You've got to pray the way I pray. You've got to worship the way I worship. You've got to set yourself a Bible reading schedule like I've set for myself. You've got to do it my way. We dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. Now, if somebody says, oh, this is the Bible reading schedule that I use, and you say, hmm, that would work for me too, there's nothing wrong with saying, okay, I'll adopt that. Mm -hmm. I've gone online and found Bible reading schedules that I don't even know the person who wrote them out, but I've used them. Mm -hmm. Okay, nothing wrong with that. But you're not doing it to be like them. Right. Right. You're right. doing it to get closer to Christ. Amen. Amen. That's right. yeah. But they, measuring themselves by themselves, and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Because, again, 
if we're just trying to be like one another, we can all be like one another in hell. <laughs> that judgment. But if we want life and peace, we need that spiritual mind that says, I want to be like Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. For to be carnally minded, carnal, mm -hmm. that word means fleshly. I want to adopt in my flesh, in my body, the ways, the outward conformity, that this person lives their life, their flesh, their outward body, to be carnally minded. I'm just going to do things the way they do it. Now, again, there are mentors that we may have, somebody that we look up to, somebody who's been an encouragement to us. But in all that you find from somebody else, take those words of Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. Right. Amen. Because we're not trying to be like this person. We're trying to be like Christ. Amen. And if that person is also trying to be like Christ, that will be their advice to you also. That's it. Right. Yes, sir. That will be, be their advice. That's right. Not holding our own standard for somebody else to live up to me. Not holding our own standard. Comparing ourselves to somebody else and, and the standard that they've reached, say, I've got to get to their level. But living for Christ. Because the ultimate proof of our faith is not ourselves. That's right. But the work that God has done in us. The work that he does is greater than any work that we can do ourselves. Better than any do-it-yourself project. Better than any self-help program. Better than any New Year's resolution. That work that he does in us, he sticks with it. He sticks with it. How many times have you set out a project and then quit I've done it. <laughs> I got computer programs downloaded on my computer. Said, oh, I'm going to learn how to use this. And never got it. I got a banjo sitting in my corner at my house. I've had it for 20 years. I can go like this. That's all I can do. After 20 years of having a banjo sitting in the corner of my house. But God starts that work in you. And it says, he which began a good work in you will be faithful to yes. perform it until right. the day yes. of Christ. That's right. That's right. That work that he started where he says, I'm going to work on this now because this is what we need to deal with now. I'm going to work on this next because this is what we have to deal with now. It's not because somebody else is saying, oh, you need to do it like I am. Although he'll bring it out in preaching. He'll bring it out to you in prayer. He'll bring it out through you reading his word. He'll bring it out as you approach a situation and the Holy Spirit deals with your heart. He'll bring it out in different ways at different times by his spirit. But that good work that he started, he's going to be the one to continue it. Until the day that we go to be with him. That's, yeah, there's nobody out there that's, that's hurt her. Her in the office. And listen to this. Again, God gave me this message. The Lord gave me this message. Because the past couple of weeks, they've been pretty hard hitting. And, and he gave me those messages as well. But this is something that I want to bring out as we're closing the service. He's going to continue that work. He who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That means he started it when we got saved. And he's going to keep working on us until the day that we go to be with and see him face to face. Mm -hmm. But he's not quick to throw us away when we fail, when we give in to temptation. You may have seen from time to time, whether it's on, on social media or, or some news story that comes across the internet or, or on television, somebody find a, an old classic car in a barn somewhere. And even if you have it, you can surely understand the illustration that I'm an old classic car in a barn somewhere, covered in rust, the engine not running, animals living in it, an old beat up hunk of junk. But somebody sees the value in it. Yes. Mm. They get a tow truck and pull it out of there and put it in their garage. And they go to work on it. They start a good work. They see the value in it while everybody else just sees rust and nuts and bolts laying on the ground. And they disassemble it. And they'll sandblast it. And they'll get their mechanics gloves on so they don't bust their knuckles. I've done that a few times. And they'll start working on it. I'm not a master mechanic or anything. I've just busted my knuckles a few times. <laughs> and they'll start working on it. And it takes them a long time. And they put money and 
time and creativity into it to get the design right. Maybe the previous interior was so shot that they just have to start over, but they say, since I'm starting it over, I'm going to make it the way I like it. All right, mm -hmm. all right. And they customize it and they do everything just the way they like it. Mm, come on. And then they're happy to have this beautifully restored car and everybody sees how wonderful the transformation is. People see a wonderful transformation when God does a work in yes. Amen. Oh yeah, that's right. And then it's out in the neighborhood. People are seeing it, maybe driving it in a parade or something, classic cars, shows. And then one day driving it, stopped at a red light, somebody comes along, rear ends it. Or even through their own foolishness. Now, God's not foolish. I'm just making an example of us having been restored by God. Even in their own foolishness, backs up into a, one of those poles in the parking lot or something. And you say, well, all of that hard work was for nothing. Just take it to the junkyard. That's not the attitude of somebody who put in a lot of time and effort. All right. That's, right. All right. That's not an attitude of somebody right. who put so much expense, creativity, who's really invested in their project. They said, this thing is worth fixing again. Yeah. 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 God yeah. looks at you yeah. and right. says, Come on. this is worth fixing again. Yeah. 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 This yeah. is worth fixing again. Thank you, Lord. And it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. You can look at your life. You can say, I've busted the bumper. It's falling off. <laughs> Cracked the windshield, towed the car, and rolled it. God looks at you and said, this is worth fixing again. Oh, yes. Thank you. And I've got scripture to back it up. Thank you. Praise Thank you. God for that. Amen. 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 He that spared not his own son, all right. but delivered him up for us all. Yes. Yes. Think about what goes into the process of somebody who restores an old junky car out of the barn. Mm. Sister, if you come to the keyboard. The money that goes into it. The time that goes into it. The effort that goes into it. Maybe they found something that they've never dealt with before, so they've got to learn. Some education goes into it. The creativity goes into it. Something doesn't go right, so they've got to undo it and do it again. Mm, they put a lot into it. God put a lot into salvation when he went to the That's cross. Right. That's right. When those whips were torn across his back. Yeah. When that crown of thorns was upon his head. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us. How shall he with him not also freely give us all things? Yes. When we say, God, I need a touch again. All right. Oh, yeah. God, I need yeah. restoration Come again. Yeah. God, I need you to fix me again. Yeah. Don't cast me aside, even as David cried. Yeah. And take me not away from thy presence, O Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy yeah. of thy salvation. Oh, because the true yeah. standard oh, yeah. is not in our outward oh, performance, but it's that righteousness that only he can give. It's that peace that we have to be right with him. And it's that joy that he restores in our life. In knowing him. And as we bow our heads and close our eyes this morning in reverence to God. In respect for those that are also here. When we know that something needs to be made right, we know that it's only Him that can make it right. Not us putting in that work because that changes. It can go away. It can come back. We do it based on our own outward circumstances, but God does it inside because He means it to last. And when it's on the inside and works to the outside, that's when it's sustained. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It cost him so dearly, he's not quick to throw us away. All right. Amen. Whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now listen to this. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. God didn't want to put us down in the first place. But that the world through him might be saved. That's what he came for was to save us. To restore us. To make us new. Not just to put a tarp over a car, but to restore it. Hallelujah. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. God didn't make things worse for us. God came to make everything right. And when things start to go bad again, we can go back to him. That true standard of righteousness is knowing that God makes things right. 
That true standard of joy is not external circumstances that make us happy or sad, but it's in knowing that joy comes from God. That peace that we have that passes all understanding isn't because things are going our way in life. But knowing that God's got us in His hand. And nothing can separate us from the love of God. As we pray this morning, let it be our prayer. God, let my outward conduct reflect what you've done inside. Not just a show, not just hypocrisy, God. But do a work that lasts, that only you can do. I'm not trying to compare myself to somebody else. But God, I'll pray for that person that I've been comparing myself to, whether I see myself as higher or lower. Because we all fall so short, so far short of you. God, I'm looking to you, even as you have looked down to save me. God bless you as you pray this morning.
lift up our hands this morning and worship the Lord, thanking Him for the work that He started and that He continues in our lives. Thank you, God, that you've seen us and loved us and came to save us. Thank you, God, that you see us as so valuable to yourself, that you'll continue the work in our lives. All we have to do is call upon you by faith. All we have to do is call upon you by faith. God, you'll guide us by your spirit. But even in those times, God, where we've strayed, where we've sinned, giving into temptation, God, that by repentance, turning away from that God and turning back to you, you will in no wise cast us out. Thank you, God, for your mercy, your love, and your grace. God, continue to work in each heart of those who've heard your word this morning, working in our lives, that we be conformed unto you and no other standard, but to receive your word by the preaching as you've, God, given the preaching of your word to save the lost, given us your word that we can know you, given us your spirit that we can learn of you. Help us, O oh God, by these things to draw closer to you with every opportunity and bring us back at the appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this morning. It's been a blessing to be in the house of God. Remember our Bible studies live streamed on Facebook Wednesday evenings at 6.30. Men's Bible study on Tuesday evenings. This, uh, this week will be at Alt's Library, which is just right over there. And uh, if you're wanting to join us for that, you're welcome to do so. Ladies Bible study on Thursday evenings. Get with Sister Watson and Sister Brooks on those dates and places. It's been a blessing to be together with you all this morning. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.